jaw drop. It was really edifying to me to hear some of the audible gasps because um, I actually um, had to be censored when <laughs> when I heard um, you know when I when I, when I went back and and and, and just reviewed the. Uh, the, the interview that I did with these detectives. So what if he didn't do it was a question that I asked. And we put it on a billboard in Oklahoma City. Some of you might have uh, read this on, on social media mm. if you've been following me. Simple question. And the social justice mob demanded that the billboard company take it down. Of course, they capitulated and acquiesced because it's Snowflake Nation, right? Mm -hmm. And um, we did a screening over the weekend in Enid, Oklahoma. It was standing room only. And this is this is Daniel's hometown where they had no idea what was happening. Uh, we mentioned the civil attorney who's representing um, a number of these accusers, the majority of them. It's Benjamin Crump. Does that name ring a bell? This is the Al Sharpton in training who represented Trayvon Martin's family and Michael Brown's family as well. So but when people ask me, well, what, what possible reason could, what, what, what is there? Cha-ching, cha-ching, cha-ching. Yeah. Um, but to merely raise the questions that, that we've raised, of course, I mean, I've been already attacked with every name in the book, and the police department brass, as you can see, are not too happy that these two detectives are getting as much ex exposure as, as we're giving them. Uh, <laughs> um, as you can tell, I'm just, I'm so fired up, and there's so many stories like this more to be told. I've already gotten a ton of, of um, com uh, comments uh, in my email and my uh, Facebook comments and uh, pleas from people um, who are undergoing similar types of injustice. So um, I'm going to open it up to Q&A. And hey, we've got to start with Kirby. Can I get more of these cards? Number two, I, I'm just curious how Daniel's case came to your attention and how you got those two detectives to talk to you on the air. Because if I had been them understanding what I've done, I wouldn't want to talk to anybody in camera about what I've done. <laughs> Especially you. <laughs> um, both questions are, are, are great. Still in jail? Yes. This is the one year anniversary of the announcement of the verdict. He was sentenced to a, an overwhelm. It's just, it's mind boggling. He's in behind bars for 263 years. And when you see the second part, what you'll see is us dissect um, many more of these accusers' stories, and it's chilling. It is absolutely chilling that this can happen in America. How it came to my attention is, is that a family friend who, uh, of the Holtz Clause, who happened to be a, 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 a fan of mine and a reader, had emailed me several times during the spring. She was just so persistent. And I don't have any assistance monitoring my email box, which still has thousands of unread messages. Um, and you know, my plate was full with, with so much of the election coverage, just like everybody else. Um, but she kept emailing, kept emailing, and I just happened to see one of her um, many missives in which she begged me to just take an, a, another look at, at the case and go beyond just uh, the superficial social media coverage of it. There were viral moments that the social justice crowd um, made famous. Some of you might remember, it might have jogged your memory, because when he cried, there was massive mockery of that moment. It was so barbaric looking back now, yeah. knowing what I know about the case, and especially after you watch the second episode, if you go back and see him cry, those are not tears of guilt. Those are, they're, those are tears of shock by a man who had entrusted the justice system to produce the, the right and just r result. Um, the second question was... Yes. Well, we asked them. <laughs> right, Kristen? Yeah. Kristen is one of the producers who, who worked on the case. I've got an amazing team at, at MMI. And of course, they're very mad now. And um, they attack the integrity of our show by two, two arguments. One, that I was too, quote unquote, aggressive <laughs> and one-sided. Um, and the other, that it's not real journalism. It's just a, quote unquote, business project. And um, so I'm, I'm hoping to um, answer them in a very effective way. 
it, I spent an hour with these detectives. They had a minder, and you'll see in the second episode, I don't want to give too much away, but they have a protector who, when I start asking questions that they don't want um, asked, um, interrupts on their behalf. Now, contrast that with Daniel, who I spoke with several times, the family, the private investigator, Brian Bates, who you'll uh, meet in the second episode, they all said, ask me anything. They were completely transparent. They had nothing to hide. And you know all here, um, especially myself having worked at the Seattle Times, just how useless so much of the local media could be. Because they're more interested in gaining access so that they can regurgitate the talking points that people in power are going to give them than actually challenging them in, in any meaningful way. Um, fake narratives have dire consequences for law-abiding Americans, and particularly for law enforcement officers who are victims of fake narratives plied by the social justice mob. Okay, more questions. Yes? Speaking of the Times, how the heck did you survive this? Did they hate you? So that was an interesting social experiment, I suppose. And Frank Letton openly bragged that um, he got a threefer out of me. Being, a, 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 he, he, what did he see? He saw a minority, he saw a woman, and then he saw a conservative. So check, check, check. So I was like, part of this, like, you know, it was almost like being in like in the glass menagerie, you know? Ooh, look at this interesting exotic thing. Um, and as some of you will remember, I was, I, I had two hats that I, that I wore. I was on the editorial board, so <laughs> I wrote all of those anomalous editorials crusading against the estate tax. You know, one of the few um, instances where the, you know, proudly progressive um, uh, publisher was on the right side of things. And no, nobody else. Right, right, of course. So it was in his self interest. And nobody else wanted to write those, but I did, I did. <laughs> Um, and then also I had a signed comb, um, and that's really where I, I felt like I made the most difference in trying to reflect, you know, such an, an underserved and undervoiced um, demographic, like right-thinking people in Seattle. <laughs> uh, let's see. Let's go in the back first. Yeah, I see you, you with the big, yeah. Uh, my question is, is considering that conservative talk radio is so popular nationwide, why don't we see the news media figuring that out in the newsprint? Yeah, <laughs> yeah um, they're blind, deaf, and dumb. That's all I can say. But they're losing money. I mean, the Seattle Times is soon to go out of business. Newspapers are shutting down nationwide. They can get advertisers. They can make money. If they turn to more conservative issues. Yeah. Uh, I, don't, I don't understand why they, well, I think just for their own survival, they don't need more. Yeah, it, it, is a, it is, a, is a strange kind of, of pathology where they don't put their own um, preservation and, and self interests first. Um, I think it's a combination of, of, of just pure hubris. Um, and denial. I mean, really, you need a psychology or psychiatry degree to, to, to figure these people out, especially in the aftermath of, of this election. Like, here's CNN that was humiliated before the world because WikiLeaks was able to expose that Donna Brazil, one of their, um, you know, prime time contributors, was leaking Ooh. questions to Hillary Clinton through a diversity anchor and partner, Roland Martin, who works for um, one of these diversity networks called TV One. And actually, there's a Holtz Claw tie that I will tell you about. Okay, so that all happened. And then, bam, they were hit with a ton of, of bricks called the Trump victory. And instead of thinking, gee, maybe not just having uh, political contributors that are, that are for Trump, but in general, just understanding you know, the, the conservative mindset, the competition, you know, embracing that. What do they do? Just weeks after the election, they've got radical Marxists cop hating Van Jones, oh. right? Hosting a special in which he, what I call, vansplained. He vansplained to the CNN audience 
who Trump voters are. This is the last person on the planet who should be given a platform and, and, and the costumery of journalism. Okay, oh, the link that, that I want to talk to you about, Roland Martin, TV1, link, uh, leaked the questions to Donna Brazil, who leaked them to Hillary Clinton. Look this up. TV1 did a, their own special on Daniel Holtzclaw. Gee, guess what narrative they ply. And in the show, they actually spread falsehoods about the DNA evidence, about the Janie Ligon stuff. The police department has said nothing about the falsehoods that were spread by these fake news purveyors. Instead, they went after us because I asked too many aggressive questions. It's not the tone of the questions, it's not the volume of the questions that bothers them. It's the questions. Yeah. Yes, ma'am, back there. You, yes, you. Hi, I'm former law enforcement. I just moved here from Arizona. And Thank I you for your service in law enforcement. <laughs> And what I'm wondering is, I can't comprehend that woman being an investigator. <laughs> she is an internal affairs investigator as well, I assume. And another thing I wanted to know is, how can we help? Is there anything that we can do? I, I honestly, the only thing I've ever remembered about this case is that crime. Mm -hmm. Yes. Because I, did, I don't even know anything about this case other than that, and I'm glad you're bringing it to our attention. There's something that we gotta do to help this guy. This yeah. can't be happening. First of all, it's so valuable to get your feedback as a law enforcement officer professional to how these people conducted their investigation. It, it's it's disgraceful. I mean, I want you all to, to I'm not asking you to to conclude after just this one um, episode that he's innocent. But clearly, there's. I've already raised, I believe, more than a molehill of reasonable doubt. Yeah. That's the standard. Yeah. Well, I'm not. I'm not um, asking you even after the second episode to come to that conclusion. But this is a miscarriage of justice, and it needs to be rectified. He's got an appeal that is due on February 1st. He'll be raising a number of issues, which you'll hear about um, in the second episode. But um, they have to rely on a public defender. They can't afford a private attorney. Eric Holtzclaw, the father, had been planning to retire. He has to continue working. He's working extra shifts. Um, his wife, um, who was a stay-at-home mom and a homemaker, um, bakes goods to make uh, a little extra money. But you can help. There are two websites that, that have been instrumental. HoltzclawTrial.com. We will mention it in the um, second episode if, if you don't write it down now. And then Jenny Holtzclaw, the sister who has basically given up her life uh, to be her brother's biggest advocate out there. And she has a website at freedanielholtzclaw.com and more background on the accusers at uh, justice for Daniel Holtzclaw. Com. It, it is an interesting exercise when you Google Daniel Holtzclaw to see the massive amount of coverage of this man and the, the narrative of, of him as this quote-unquote serial racist predator. And then when you see the other side of the story, it really makes you question everything that you see on TV if you all haven't already. Yes, ma'am, right here. So, so the police are not providing good defense for him? What about ACLJ no. and Alliance Defense Fund and a whole bunch of other Yes, yeah, so, so Jenny has reached out to many organizations. Of course, so many of you, I'm sure, are, um, are aware of the so-called Innocence Project, right? And they've done a lot of great work to free um, innocent people <coughs> over the years. But you look at Daniel Holtzclaw, and, I mean, Innocence Project is a left-wing group. And Dan, uh, Jenny has gone to the Innocence Project in Oklahoma and basically been blown off. If I, if I were, you know, someone with the wealth of a Bill Gates or a Mark Zuckerberg, I would start a right-thinking alternative to the Innocence Project because there are law enforcement officers that the Innocence Project will ignore simply because 
they are police officers. And by the way, Benjamin Crump, that Al Sharpton in training, sits on the board of the Innocence Project in Florida. Yes, sir, right there. I want to applaud the work that you're doing. I think you're a civil servant to many people, including myself. I consider you a hero. Um, I have some assumptions about liberals. Um, I am not a liberal. Um, uh, I think hypocrisy is very consistent in the liberal mindset. I do think it is a mindset. Uh, you mentioned that a little bit earlier. Can you express uh, to us some of the themes or some of the consistencies that you've seen in, in all your experience and your investigations of what's in the mind of a liberal so that we can predict? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Wow, what a great question. That sounds like a book. <laughs> I need to clone me so I can write that book while I'm doing Michelle Malkin Investigates. Um, my formative years were on a crazy, radical, liberal campus, and I know that's redundant. I went to Oberlin College, which is the berserkly of the Midwest, and people always ask me, how'd you end up there? Well, they have a wonderful conservatory of music that hasn't been corrupted by radical left-wing politics, and I thought I was going to be a classical pianist, but that didn't work out. Um, and it was, first of all, the... The uber theme of um, diversity uber alles and these liberal fascists who were so steeped in identity politics that they were blind to their overt racism and, and discrimination. When I first arrived on campus, the first thing they did was segregate me and assign me to Asia House. <laughs> like, I had never thought of myself as Asian. And what did I, the first um, a generation daughter of uh, socially conservative Filipino immigrants who came here legally, who revered Ronald Reagan, have in common with second and third generation Chinese or Japanese American students from LA or San Francisco or Seattle. I was not popular at Asia House. <laughs> but but the, the, the unique trait of left-wing progressivism, and it's, you know, it's, it's almost unfair to say liberal, because they hijacked that. Yes. We're classical liberals. Yes. They're the most illiberal people in America. And it was these radical progressives who would shut down even an iota or a whisper of dissent. They were the ones who, when we brought Dinesh D'Souza, any fans of Dinesh D'Souza here? When, when my husband and I, um, who had founded, you know, sort of our version of the Dartmouth Review, the, and, and I go back and I look at how milk toast and moderate we really were, and we were seen as like these, you know, fascist purveyors. When we brought Dinesh to campus, it wasn't just the students that were trying to drown him out before he began his speech at, you know, this beautiful, soaring setting in Finney Chapel. No, it was the faculty members, and it was the administrators leading it. These snowflakes and buttercups who couldn't stand being exposed to unorthodox ideas. And that has been, uh, you know, an operatic light motif theme that has, that has run through the course of so much of my reporting on these particular issues with these episodes, the intersection between race and criminal justice and social justice and the people who stand on the thin blue line. My first newspaper job was not in Seattle, but in Los Angeles Daily News in the aftermath of the LA riots. Mm -hmm. And the first piece that I did as a freelancer after college, the piece that got me a job at the LA Daily News questioned the conventional wisdom of whether or not the Simi Valley police should have been thrown in jail for the Rodney King incident. Mm -hmm. Yes, ma'am. So um, I'm thinking about what can we do <laughs> so, unfortunately for Daniel, I, these are state crimes that are not federal, so he couldn't grant that kind of clemency. 
But if there were not enough of a, of a tipping point of outside pressure on Republican Oklahoma Governor Mary Fallon, she's the one that could grant that clemency. And in fact, if you go to Jenny's site at freedanielholtzclaw.com, she has a link to a petition. There are some, I mean, this is even before we, we called attention to the case. She just on her own um, was able to garner 2,000 signatures on that petition. But boy, what if it was 4,000? Um, and what if there was more pressure on the Oklahoma media to do their dang jobs? Uh, is there a Patreon or a GoFundMe that we could, you know, do lawyer fees? Yes. So they do have a, a legal defense fund, and there is a PayPal. And for those people who are uncomfortable with doing online payments, I, I believe there's also a physical address uh, for that as well. And again, it's like full transparency. You know, Jenny's very clear about where that money will be spent <coughs> if they make it past the this appeal deadline on February 1st, they're hoping that they can get a, a private appellate attorney. Right now, the public defender has 30 cases on his plate, and he's never even met the Holtz Club. Is there any hope of getting the ACLJ involved? If, if you write them, maybe they will. It, it would be well, wonderful. Jay is such a big guy. He is, and it would it would be one. Now, of course, they they mostly do religious liberty cases, but it's possible that they've they've expanded. But you know what I think? It points out a, a hole that there's a gap here, a vacuum that needs to be filled. And you know, I'll be trying to. Um, I already have a couple of um, influential people in mind that I I think that this this hole needs to be filled. Like I said, but it would be great if, if y'all. Um, you know, could raise national awareness of, of this with these nonprofit um, legal foundations. Let's go. Uh, let's go all the way in the back, ma'am. Just a comment. That, I mean, don't forget Facebook. Just yes. Get it out there. I just posted that website, one of his websites, and said, "This is what doing justice looks like." People are going to read it. Yeah. You've got to just keep posting, asking yeah. you to share it. That's absolutely right, and that does remind me that Jenny also is on Facebook, and she's very active in responding to people, answering any questions, doubts that they might have. She she gives people full access and keeps people updated on, on her Facebook. Um, but there's something else I want to say as well, too. Remember that most of Silicon Valley is so leftist. I mean, look, I mean, the, the uh, one of the co-founders of Twitter was marching with Black Lives Matter in Ferguson and basically holds up uh, DeRay McKesson as his, you know, pet, um, uh, the, the outspoken Black Lives Matter activist. And I love it. I think it's sort of social media jujitsu to use their own platforms to defeat their social justice agenda. <laughs> Uh, that's what we have to do. And so, we're, I mean, we're so effective on it that what what are they doing? They're banning um, the most prominent conservatives and, and activists and voices on Twitter. Until they push everyone, last one of us out on there, though, crank it up. How many of you have Twitter accounts up? I'm, I'm just curious. Yes, I hope you all are tweeting about um, our event here today and, and help spread the word, not only about this case, but but about what we're doing, we, we appreciate that so much. Yes, sir, right in the middle. Um, coming from a broadcast family and having been a writer and producer of documentaries, one of which played on Showtime Network for a year, I want to tell you that the production values of this new product far exceed anything that I normally see on the networks or on, on large independent um, uh, production companies. And the proof of that is in this first half that you've showed us, you're already laying such a strong groundwork for the second half, which where I know you're going to explore that there's two problems associated with this case. The first one is if he's truly innocent, but the second problem is just as important. If he is indeed guilty, but the quality of the evidence and the process violates his constitutional rights, is there one standard for all of us and another standard that's different for law enforcement? And, and, and that may be the answer to getting the governor to do the right thing, which is we're not expecting you to be the final arbiter of whether he's innocent or guilty. We're asking you for to, to stand up for the constitutional rights 
of those who serve us as well as those of us who are served. Your name is? We had dinner at the Lincoln Days uh, oh event. My gosh. I'm Kim Cooney, and I so enjoyed that evening oh, with you. Oh, Kim, thank you so much for coming, and thank you for your promise. I couldn't put it any better than you just did. I'm humbled by uh, by your assessment of our production values. The product is exceptional. Thank you. Thank you. I hope you all will spread the word about it. I, I just, I, we, we, have, we are a lean, mean team, and we're doing this at a fraction of the budget of you know Showtime-type documentaries. And I, I think in part, um, I think in part that that on the part of, of um, so much of the mainstream corrupt media and people who are in this space, that they don't think that we could or should be producing the quality of programming that we are. So one of the problems that we're going to face is people are going to ignore us. Um, and then they're going to do what they do with any other alternative media provider that is challenging the monopoly. They're going to try and marginalize us. Um, they're going to um, attack our integrity, as, as we're already seeing with, um, with a lot of the uh, Oklahoma coverage we're seeing. It was so frustrating because we had these uh, local TV stations, and they would cover that there was a controversy. And then they would run to the social justice spokeswoman to get her opinion about the controversy. And then they, they I mean, I'm everywhere. You can tweet me. You can find me on Facebook. And none of these people actually wanted to talk about what's in the documentary. It's like the huge elephant in the room. I've never seen anything like it. And I think, man, you know, what if I were, um, what if I were Jenny Holtzclaw? And, and not me, and I, and I didn't have this kind of platform. I mean, how many cases like this go on every day where there isn't somebody capable of fighting back? Probably have time for one more question. Uh, let's see, who, 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 yes, ma'am. Well, we at Michelle Malkin Investigates, we will be doing that, uh, much more of that, of following the money and collecting and connecting <coughs> the dots. Um, one of the future shows that we have for you is going to be on the next generation Soros, uh, an environmental nutball named Tom Steyer. Yes, and um, we'll be digging deep into that. The thing is, you know, you're not going to get it on CNN or MSNBC or even Fox News. I mean, it, it, there's a certain formula that these, so many of these television shows follow, and I know it's frustrating for people who are looking for substantive programming, and that's why we exist. Thank you so much for your time, Mary Christine.